So good morning everybody and welcome to the Fusion HR webinar on managing return to work meetings. Um, our presenter today is Katie Craker. Um, Katie is uh, one of our HR consultants but she's also part of our leadership team and heads up the staff absence management software team as well within Fusion and Sam. Um, she's obviously got extensive education experience to share with you today um, and has been with Fusion for over 10 years. Um, so please do ask any questions that you feel you have um, on the Q&A and we will do our best to answer those either during or at the end of the session. So without further ado, I'm going to pass you over to Katie to take you through today's webinar. Thanks, Amory. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, so as Amory says, um, I am one of the um, HR consultants within Fusion HR. And I also head up the um, staff absence management um, part of our business, which is a software product um, for schools um, to assist with helping to manage staff attendance. I know we've got quite a few some clients and Fusion clients on today, so um, obviously um, different people will be familiar with different aspects that I'm talking about. Um, I will mention Sam as we go through the um, presentation. Um, and for those of you that don't have it, um, it might just be something that you um, makes you think about how how you can best do certain things and whether a, a system would assist you to do that. Um, as a business as well, we're also launching some people in September, um, which is a holistic HR system. So um, that's just something that we can um, chat to you about as well, if that's of interest. Okay, so today's session, we are going to be looking at Spare me two minutes. Right, there we go. Okay, so we're going to be looking at um, holding a return to work meeting, but also um, before we get to that point, we need to think about preparation. And preparation is really key um, in terms of from an organisation point of view, but also um, the individual's perspective. So we can talk through that. Then we're going to look at the actual meeting, the um, do's and don'ts, and the best um, ways to handle a return to work meeting. And also looking at then things to consider. So um, occupational health as an example um, and how you can really use these um, additional services to get the best out of them. Um, as part of our staff um, absence management um, company we um, hold a lot of roadshows and we quite often hear of schools frustrations in managing staff attendance um, be it around um, systems or accessing data or, or being able to um, spend the right amount of time to, to give to uh, managing staff attendance. It can be quite time consuming. So hopefully um, I can give you a few hints and tips today on the best ways in which you can um, do those things to hopefully improve staff attendance within your school organisation. Okay, so we all, before we even think about the actual meeting, um, we need to think about preparation um, and from a school perspective, um, we need to consider, you know, do we have the correct information at a school level? Is there a concern regarding um, staff attendance at your school or organisation? Um, and can we easily access this information? So one of the things that um, is a good indicator is the cost of absence. And quite often we find that um, schools and, and organisations find that really hard to calculate. Um, sometimes that's because the systems that you record your absence information into don't necessarily give you really easy access to um, that information. Um, we actually partner, um, I know a lot of schools um, are still using SIMS to record absence data and we actually partner with Capita SIMS um, because um, the, the software that we provide um, in SAM enhances that product and allows you to really um, get some really good reports out of that in terms of your data. But even without SAM, um, using the existing systems that you've got in school, can you really um, calculate the cost of absence so that you know whether or not there is an issue in your school? And the cost isn't just the physical cost of that member of staff's salary. Um, I obviously um, appreciate that schools will have already budgeted and, and organisations will have budgeted for the employee's um, salary when they're absent from, from work. But there's a bigger cost um, in terms of um, cover. Um, if you're using supply agencies to provide cover for you when members of staff are absent, um, there's obviously that cost involved, or you might use internal staff for cover, but obviously there's still the cost of that employee's salary. And then there's the impact on your organisation as well. So 
whether that be an impact on education standards or an impact on your organisation in terms of um, productivity, etc. Um, so cost of absence is, is a really key fundamental part to um, be able to um, accurately calculate to find out whether or not um, you have a, an absence concern within your organisation. And then thinking about absence data. Um, so for example, would you, if, if I asked you how many days absence, um, how many days you lost last year due to sickness absence um, for employees, would you be able to um, easily give an answer? Would you know it anyway? Quite often when we go into schools, um, uh, you know, staff are very familiar with the um, days lost for um, and percentage attendance for pupils, but not necessarily always for staff. Um, so if you don't know it, um, can you easily get access to that data? Do you know how you compare to the national average? Um, it's currently 5.8 days in education, the national average. Um, it does tend to be um, higher in the public sector um, than the private sector. And that possibly comes down to um, sick pay schemes. So the public sector does um, have, generally speaking, more generous sick pay schemes than the private sector obviously not in all cases, but um, a lot of private sector organisations um, provide statutory sick pay only. Um, and I think this highlights really that if we are really going to reduce the um, amount of absence in, in schools and organisations, and you do have generous sick pay schemes, so unless you're going to be really radical and decide, you know, Burgundy Book and Green Book are going in the bin and as a, as a multi-academy trust, um, you're going to negotiate new national conditions for your trust. Um, the only way you are really going to make an impact and reduce sickness absence is by managing the process and following your policy. And actually the, re the research shows um, that the best way to do that is through return to work meetings. Um, they are the um, most, um, well, the key to unlocking absences, but they, the fundamental part to improving attendance. Okay, so thinking about how we do that then. Um, the first step needs to be your um, staff attendance policy. And, and right now is probably a really good time of year to be considering whether or not your policy um, meets the needs of your organisation. So is it fit for purpose? Does it, does it do what you need it to do? Um, and if it doesn't, really think about um, making either changes to that or speaking to your trust um, about whether or not you need to um, look at a new policy. You can have whatever attendance policy you want. Um, I say slightly, um, slightly smiling in terms of, obviously that has to go through a consultation process and um, would need to go through um, the unions, et cetera. But even as a local authority school, if you don't want the local authority policy, you don't have to. Now, clearly there are benefits of using the local authority policy because they've probably done that hard work with the unions for you. But if that policy is just not working for you, then please um, feel free to, um, to look at adopting a new one. You, know, if you can get your HR provider involved in, in negotiating and consulting on a new policy. Um, and once you've got the policy, really look at the trigger points. Are they right for you? Do, do they work? Do they, do they give you um, what you need in terms of being able to really target attendance? And if they don't, again, that might be something you want to consider um, making amendments to. Then, then thinking about, you know, do you follow your policy consistently? And it might be that your policy is absolutely fine and does what you need it to do, but for whatever reason, it's just not being utilised. And, you know, you know, you're not following the stages that are within that policy. And if that's the case, then again, now is an absolutely great time of year to think, let's, um, let's review this policy. Let's, um, let's just, you know, even if it's working for you, um, it's reviewed and, and it's gone through the consultation with the uh, unions and your governors have already adopted it. Maybe September inset is a good time to think, let's roll this out to staff again. Um, let's just remind them of what's in it. Have, you know, have they received a copy? Have they signed um, to say that they've read and understood it? Um, so you can walk through that policy with them at, in September and then make sure you're following that going forward. And consistency is absolutely key with managing attendance. Um, Obviously, the process that you follow needs to be identical and consistent for all staff. 
the outcomes may be different depending on the individual and their specific health concerns. Um, but absolutely, we shouldn't be picking and choosing who we do return to works for, for example. And I'll come on to that a little bit later on. Um, but we do need to be um, to be consistent um, to avoid discrimination claims. OK, so in the policy, um, we need to um, look at how does someone report an absence? And um, I always joke and say, don't shoot the messenger. Text message is not the best way to report somebody's um, absence. Now, I fully appreciate in specifically in secondary schools, um, maybe primary as well, maybe other organisations, text message can be really useful um, because you need to know quite early on in the morning for cover purposes who's going to be absent that day. But it's not necessarily the, the best method in terms of you then being able to have a constructive conversation with that individual. So we always say switch off the uh, answer phone, turn off text messaging, make that person have a conversation. If you do need those facilities, answer phone and, and text message, make sure you've got um, a process in place whereby those employees are phoned back. And, and, and then whoever's responsible for making those calls is trained and understands what sort of conversations they can have um, with that person. So just as an example, if someone phones in at seven o'clock or sends a text message, uh, not going to be in today, they've got, they've got a headache. Um, you know, if you could have a conversation with that person, you might ask them some questions about, have they taken some um, medication, paracetamol maybe? Do they want to phone back in two hours um, when that's had a chance to work? Um, and may they therefore be able to work in the afternoon and it's just a half day absence rather than a full day. So having, having somebody um, to be able to phone those people back can obviously help to get people back into work. Um, the policy should also think about who is responsible for each area of the absence process. Um, and when we're thinking about return to works, they really do need to sit with line managers where possible. I still hear in a lot of organisations where head teachers, for example, or business managers are conducting all return to work meetings. And that's not necessarily going to, one, be, um, doable if, if you're doing them for every single member of staff, which, which you obviously should be. Um, and two, it, it hinders the, the rest of the process because it means then that if you need to escalate that person through the policy, um, and they may hit a trigger and, and require a, a stage one meeting, for example, if that head teacher or business manager has already done all the return to work meetings, it, it then doesn't have any kind of emphasis to move it to the next level. Um, and another problem that can occur is that you end up needing to involve governors sooner than you may have otherwise have done. Um, and obviously, arranging meetings with a, a panel of governors can be more time consuming and, and difficult than, than internal staff. So really think about who you are in your policy, who you are assigning each part of the process to. Um, we then need to um, think about um, return to works um, and how how frequently they're carried out. They should be for every single absence, regardless of length. Um, and this is best practice. There's no legislation that says that is the case. But it, as I've already mentioned, um, return to works are absolutely key to unlocking absences and reducing um, absences. So um, they need to be carried out for every single absence. Um, we need to keep a record of that return to work meeting. Usually, um, that would be on a form um, a lot that's then kept alongside the self-certification form. And that form would normally be standardised to capture certain information, such as um, the specific details of that specific absence, but also things like, did they follow the absence reporting procedure? Um, are they fit to return to work? Do they need any support? Um, have they hit a trigger? Um, may they be um, covered by the Equality Act uh, for a disability? Um, and all these things we'll come on to um, talk about in, in this session. But it's really important that you have a standardised form to ensure that the return to work um, interview follows the same structure for all. Um, okay, and the, the meeting should be um, a supportive process. Um, so it's a, a two way conversation. Okay, and then just thinking about training. Sorry, I've jumped down a slide. Let's just go back up one. 
um, training for line managers. Um, quite often um, in organisations, um, employees are, are promoted and um, become a line manager because they're really good at um, the job that they were carrying out. So just to give a, a school example, you know, you're an outstanding teacher of maths, so you know, eventually you become the head of maths and you've suddenly got a team of people that you're, you have line management responsibility for. And I think we really need to question, you know, do we provide those people with the right training for things like managing staff attendance? Because line managers can quite often see things like return to work, so there's just another task to carry out. Um, and knowing how to effectively manage that and improve attendance can support and, and motivate their employees that they're responsible for. Um, but line managers really need to understand what part they play in that process and, and have been trained on what they can and can't say or what they should and shouldn't say. Because without that, I think um, they tend to err on the side of caution and then feel uncomfortable with having those conversations because they're worried about saying or doing the wrong thing. Um, so in terms of training, it's, it's really important that we... Um, we, we talk to them about asking open questions, um, allowing employees to be able to open up. They may have sensitive issues to discuss. Um, talking to them about the differences between short-term absence and long-term absence. Talking to them about how you arrange a return to work meeting and what preparations required, very similar to what we're doing now. What to record, um, any actions and outcomes and, and how to escalate that if, if required. Um, and it's really, really um, important that line managers understand that they're not there to act as counsellors. They're not there to give medical advice. You know, you get HR involved in meetings as well. We're, we're not medical professionals either. So it's really important that they understand that they're there to gather the information, but not to make judgments on people's medical conditions without the support of processes like occupational health. Um, they don't need to make exceptions for people other than in the sense of reasonable adjustments. They're not there to interrogate staff um, and they're not there to tag on other issues. So they need to be real, really understanding that they keep the absence process separate. You know, there may be a performance process ongoing. Um, there may be um, other issues um, that are going on with that individual, but the return to work meeting needs to be purely about their, their uh, absence. Okay. And then thinking about um, preparation for the actual meeting. Um, so once you've got all your school preparation in place, your line managers are trained, your policy is absolutely robust and fit for purpose. You've got all your absence stats and your data and you, you understand the cost of absence and how you're matching to the national average. Thinking about the individual's meeting and what preparation you require for that. Um, so it's really important that you've got accurate information um, about the individual's absence record. There's nothing worse than sitting in a meeting um, with a union rep and an employee to talk about their absence and you've recorded something incorrectly and they've, they shouldn't be sat there in front of you. Um, so making sure um, you've identified the key points that you're going to convey, maybe set an agenda. It's likely to be the return to work form, but there may be other things that you want to discuss. Um, have information on any adjustments that you've already put in place. and um, some really good data about whether or not they've, already, they've hit a trigger by that absence that they've just had. So is that return to work meeting the last one that you're going to have when they've hit a trigger? Or are they likely to need to be informed that if they have another absence in a set period of time, that that will hit a trigger and that what they can expect in terms of the policy? And any patterns of absence that may be apparent, um, be prepared with that so you can have that discussion with them as well. Okay, so the actual meeting then. Um, I say it goes without saying, I do still hear of some weird and wonderful places that return to work meetings have been held, um, but they need to be in a confidential place. Um, we don't want to be carrying out return to work meetings at the side of someone's desk or, you know, um, in the staff room or Costa Coffee or wherever it might be. Um, they really do need to be held in a confidential place um, so that sensitive issues can be discussed. They need to be held on the first day back, wherever possible. Obviously, the later that you conduct that return to work meeting, the, the less impact or significance it's going to have. So on the first day where possible, I'd say if you're carrying them out after the third day back, it, 
it's probably getting to the point where it's becoming less significant. Um, each individual um, meeting will be different depending on the employee's situation. So as we discussed, every member of staff should have a meeting following the process. That meeting is going to look different depending on the circumstances. So someone you've had in your employment for five years who's just had one absence um, is going to look very different to somebody who's been with you for 12 months and you're carrying out your sixth return to work meeting. So the emphasis and, and, and the outcomes of that meeting um, are individual to that individual circumstances. Um, you need to understand the reason for the absence and whether they're fit to return to work. You might want to discuss things like, have they visited their GP while they've been off? Did they have a hospital stay, etc.? cetera? Um, and then you can talk about any support that they may need. So is there any assistance that could support them to improve their attendance? Um, may they have some uh, underlying health condition that you need to be aware of? They may be having tests, they might not actually know the answer to that question, but if they've got um, symptoms that may affect them while they're at work, it's, it's about understanding what they are and how you can support them with that. Um, you need to look at whether there are any factors um, at work that may have contributed to their absence or, or equally outside of work. And, and if there are, what action might be taken to help them with that situation? Um, you might want to then update them on anything they've missed while they've been absent. Again, that's going to look very different for somebody who's had a long term absence to somebody who's had a couple of days off with a cold um, like illness. Um, and then you might want to talk about um, any, any patterns of absence. If, if it's relevant and your policy allows for this, you may want to consider setting an improvement target. Now, in our um, software, we call this a monitoring round, um, but different policies use different language. And basically that's setting somebody um, a, a target to um, tell them what you expect going forward and how you expect their um, attendance to improve. So only if it's relevant and only if your policy suggests you do this at a return to work meeting, um, would you then go on to set an improvement target? Okay. One of the areas that um, I think um, organisations and schools find more difficult to manage is disability. Um, and I've just put the um, definition here for you from the Equality Act 2010. And um, it refers to um, substantial and long term negative effect on ability to do normal day to day activities. So substantial means that their um, condition is more than minor or trivial. Um, so it's going to have a, a, an impact on doing normal tasks. And long term means 12 months or more. And that's not that they have to have had the condition for 12 months or more. It means that they will have the condition for 12 months or more. So they may have been experiencing um, symptoms for two or three months and have now been told that the condition is X, um, but because that condition will last for 12 months or more, they are covered under the Equality Act. Um, only a tribunal will ever tell you um, if somebody is, is covered. So given that that definition is relatively easy to meet, it, it kind of gives us, gets us to ask the question, is it, is it worth getting hung up on whether employees meet the definition or not? Because if someone's got a condition and they're struggling and they need some support at work, why not just assume that everybody who has that scenario does meet the definition? Because if they do, your um, obligation as an employer is to consider reasonable adjustments. And as a good employer, would, would we not want to do that anyway? So I think sometimes we, we get a bit too bogged down in is this employee disabled or not? Um, and I would suggest that we, we just consider that they, they, they are and look at what reasonable adjustments we can put in place to support them. And I think the key here is, um, is the word reasonable. Um, so I've just got here for you the ACAS definition. So a reasonable adjustment is a change to remove or reduce the effect of an employee's disability so they can do their job or a job applicant's disability when applying for a job. So thinking about what that might look like, um, 
So you might be looking at changes and adjustments to the workplace, and that might be things to do with um, access, um, chairs, you know, needing a, a lift key, that sort of thing. Um, so anything that's a, an adjustment to the workplace. Or you might be looking at the way things are done. So is that about their hours? Um, do they struggle first thing in the morning? So they might need an adjustment in their hours, for example. Or um, getting someone um, help to help the employee or, or job applicant. We're talking about employees in this scenario. So it might be that um, they, need, they need an aid or a support to help them with certain aspects of their role. And I think when it comes to reasonable in an education setting, I would say that anything that has a detrimental impact on students learning is probably not going to be seen as reasonable. So if, if you are looking at adjustments and you're thinking, well, how would I know if this is reasonable or not? Um, one example I use is um, a real life example where a, a school was um, had a member of staff struggling with migraines. They'd put lots of adjustments in place um, and this employee um, wanted to work in one specific classroom and it was a secondary school and the school had limited the amount of classroom changes that this individual needed to do but they couldn't reduce it to the point she was in one room only and when I think the the key here is if if, if you are going to say I'm sorry that's not reasonable and um, you need to be able to justify why and they were able to show the negative impact that that was going to have on such a large number of students because of the amount of moving around they would have had to do um, and the impact on the number of um, year groups and different students to accommodate this member of staff in one room only. So, like I say, it comes down to what's reasonable and if, if you aren't able to put an adjustment in place that has been um, asked for, it's just about, rather than just saying, no, sorry, that's not reasonable, it's about being able to show, well, why is it unreasonable and, and what's the negative impact um, on our organisation. Just checking the um, Q&A, we've, we've not got any questions at the moment, but if anyone does have any, please feel free to, to pop them on the Q&A. Okay, so moving on then, um, things to consider at the return to work meeting or, or during the absence process. Um, obviously, if someone's had a long term absence, then you may be considering a phased return to work. Um, usually they're um, recommended by occupational health or on a fit, fit to return note. Um, a standard first return would normally be over around four weeks um, but they can obviously be shorter or longer than that depending on, on your needs and the employee's needs. Um, we do in some circumstances see rehabilitation um, to work suggested by um, occupational health um, and that's where somebody is not quite fit to return. Um, with a first return you need to be fit to return, you're just building up your hours because you've been out of work for a long time Rehabilitation is more around being able to um, rehabilitate while you're coming into the workplace and normally they would be over a much longer period, so for example 12 weeks. Um, we've just got a question here about um, do we have to give a copy of the return to work to the employee? Yeah, I would, I would recommend you do. Transparency is always the best, uh, the best option. Um, I would actually fill that form in with the individual. Um, at the meeting and ask them to just review it and sign it while you're there to try and make the process um, less administrative. Um, in SAM we do have the facility to um, complete return to works electronically now via the um, employee portal. So for customers within SAM um, that are on this webinar, if, if you haven't um, got the employee portal live and you, and you want to do so, get in touch with the team um, and we can now set return to works electronically so you can complete the form with them on the system while, while you're with them and um, send that through to their portal and they can sign that off. But yeah, absolutely. Please, um, please do share the, the, the record of the meeting. Um, that, that meeting form should then be used to form the basis of any conversations you're having further down the line. So if, if they go on to hit a trigger point um, and a, a, another member of staff is having a review meeting with them as a stage one, for example, it should be the return to work meeting forms that, that form the basis of that conversation. So it's really important that they've been shared in advance. Okay, um, just moving on to occupational health then. Um, 
I know um, lots, lots of people get frustrated by um, reports that they receive um, from occupational health. And the way to get the best out of a referral, I would say, is treat the referral form as your appointment. Um, so the employee will have their actual appointment, that's the appointment you're paying for, um, and at that appointment they're going to be asked all about their health history, um, any concerns they've got, um, you know, the doctor will talk through and, and that will be their information. The only input you've got into that meeting is the referral form. So I would absolutely see the referral form as your appointment. And I think that will really help to you to get the best out of those, um, those appointments and, and get a good report back. And, and on that form, I would tell them everything you've done so far. You know, you've all had that report back where you think, well, this didn't tell me anything I didn't already know. But if was that information in the referral form? So if you've, you know, if they're recommending some adjustments and you think, well, we did that 12 months ago, make sure it's on the referral that goes to that doctor, um, because that is absolutely the best way to get to get a good report back. So tell them all the adjustments you've already made. Um, tell them anything unique to your school. Um, I think the majority um, of um, referrals I, I see, people tend to enclose um, a job description for that person. But do you go into specifics about um, anything about your school, anything about their role that's really unique that occupational health wouldn't necessarily know? So for example, um, if you've got a lunchtime supervisor who's struggling with mobility um, and you've got a split site and you've got steps all over the place and, and you know, you've got a road that runs between the two sites, occupational health won't know that um, unless you put that information into the referral form. So absolutely tell them everything you can that's um, unique about your school or their role. And then don't be afraid to ask some really clear specific questions. So someone who's um, been off long term um, that you're concerned about when they might be fit or whether they will be fit to return to work, ask occupational health, will this employee be fit in the foreseeable future? If you have someone who um, has high frequent um, sickness absence and you're concerned about their attendance year on year and, and how the impact that has on the school and how that might um, pan out going forwards, um, provide a year on year breakdown to occupational health on the referral form. So um, you can put the percentage attendance potentially um, for maybe the last three, maybe the last five years. Um, and ask occupational health based on the um, previous absence history, what is the likelihood of them providing us with a reliable level of service going forward? And you can determine what that reliable level of service is. So if you expect 96% from your students, you know, do you expect the same from your staff? So, and obviously if someone's got a, a, an ongoing health condition or they're um, covered by the Equality Act, you may make some reasonable adjustment to that expectation but you still need to have a reliable level of service from that individual. Um, and also seek advice from them about reasonable adjustments as we've talked about. Um, we aren't the medical experts, we, we can look at the um, situation and, and the school or the organisation and see what adjustments we think might be useful, but occupational health are best placed for telling us what those adjustments may look like. Okay, counselling and CBT. Um, thinking about what, what would help to support that employee. Um, again, occupational health um, are probably best place to advise whether that's something that would be appropriate. Um, but there's nothing to stop you having those conversations with an employee if they're struggling and they've um, talked to you about a situation and, and it would appear that counselling was appropriate. Um, and obviously, um, in times when funding is, isn't as readily available and, and schools struggle with um, finances, um, schools aren't always in a position to fund um, these things. However, what I would say is you, you need to weigh up the cost of that employee staying off sick for a longer period or funding some counselling, as an example, that may help that employee to return to work sooner than they otherwise would have done. So there, there is a bit of a balance and, and a consideration to make in terms of, yes, we don't have lots of money to um, provide lots of um, funding for counselling and things, but if, if it does help to bring those employees back to work sooner, absolutely worth the investment um, rather than spending the money on 
supply cover and um, then the um, absence as we've discussed. And then thinking about risk assessments, um, work related stress or um, anything where the employee is, is struggling in terms of well-being, risk assessments are really useful um, to understand from a well-being perspective what that individual is finding difficult, um, what, what is contributing to their feeling of, of stress um, in the workplace. And we have template forms at, at Fusion that um, we can obviously share with you in terms of the best way to do um, the risk assessments. But it's really trying to understand what, what causes the, the stress for that individual and then looking at what can the employer do to try to alleviate those, those things and what can the employee do themselves. So it's not just um, all down to the employer to look at how can we prevent this or try to try and alleviate it, you probably can't prevent it. Um, it you know, there, are, there is onus on the individual as well um, to look at what, what they can do and how they can try to support themselves. And putting it all down on a, on a stress risk assessment is a really useful way of, of being able to support that person. Okay, I'm just looking at the time. We're just coming um, towards the end of the session now. Um, but obviously, um, given the situation we're in at the moment, um, I thought that a lot of people might be attending the session thinking about return to work after um, the kind of unprecedented situation we're in at the moment. Um, so just thinking about um, getting staff back to work following the um, pandemic of COVID, um, planning is again going to be absolutely key and I know schools have um, particularly been um, planning really hard and, and getting risk assessments and things in place um, to support some students back but um, maybe thinking about there's, there's probably going to be more staff coming back in September if you've not got, already got all your staff back in work. And I think you're going to have a, a variety of um, different scenarios going on in terms of those staff that have been out of the workplace for quite a long time now, working from home potentially, furloughed potentially, um, shielding, living with someone who's shielding. So there's going to be lots of different scenarios to think about and possibly anxiety to manage um, around that as well. So preparation and planning for those staff is going to be really key. Um, so discussing plans with staff at an early opportunity is going to be really important. Um, thinking about how they're going to travel to work, people who um, use public transport may be feeling less comfortable with that. Um, does your organisation have the option, for example, to increase the amount of parking facilities if, if that's an issue that um, is there? Um, thinking about how health and safety is being reviewed and managed um, and sharing the risk assessments that you've put together with your staff so they can see exactly what considerations you've, um, you've taken, what risks you've identified and what, what you are putting in place to prevent those risks. Um, how, how will you move forward in terms of getting everyone back into the workplace? Will it be a phased approach? Um, will you continue having some staff working from home? Um, to try and limit numbers in the workplace. Um, so there's probably going to continue to be a period of time where um, things still don't look quite as they used to. Um, and staff may be worried about this. They may be worried about um, continuing to work from home. They may be worried about still living with people or, or having um, health conditions themselves. Um, so I think individual risk assessments for those people are going to be really important. Um, and you've probably already done a lot of this, um, so it's probably just telling you what you already know, because um, I know obviously you've got staff back in already. Um, but thinking about individual risk assessments for anyone who's either got their own health concern, um, like I said, living with someone with a health concern, um, there's probably still going to be a lot of people who've got issues with caring for children, like myself and Anne-Marie <laughs> mentioned at the start. Um, you know, there's still going to be a lot of people who are, who, whose children aren't back in school yet. Um, and whilst there's plans for September, we still don't fully know what that will look like. So um, issues around um, childcare may continue for a little time yet if people don't have the appropriate wraparound care, for example. Um, so it may be that you know, start need, need to start thinking more outside the box in terms of you know, how, how people's hours are, are set out. Um, do, they, do they need extra time off? Do they need unpaid leave? Do they need to be able to use annual leave? 
um, differently to how they had done previously. Um, as, as an organisation as well, um, Fusion are offering um, COVID um, assessments via occupational health. That's an additional service that our occupational health provider um, have set up at this time. So if that's something that um, is of interest to you, then obviously please do get in touch. Okay, so that brings me to the end of my um, prepared information. But if anyone does have any um, questions, please feel free to pop it on the Q&A and we will try our best to either answer now or get an answer back to you as soon as we can. Thanks ever so much, Katie, for that. That was a really helpful presentation. Uh, we have had one question come through on the chat while we just wait for okay. anybody else to, uh, to share their questions. Uh, just before I, I read that out, to share your questions, literally all you have to do is click on the Q&A, the, the top or bottom of your screen, depending on how you're logged in. It's a double speech mark button there uh, that says Q&A. Just pop that on, type it in. Nobody else can see your questions, um, only myself and Katie, and then we'll be able to, to come back to you. Um, so the one that we've got while, uh, on the chat during came from um, Maisie and it says, is it only after the employee has seen the OP that a phase return should be introduced or can a line manager do this on the back of a GP's recommendation? Uh, no, you can absolutely do that off the back of a GP recommendation. Um, I think I would always um, look at how long have they been out of the workplace and what is the purpose of the first return. So someone who's been out of work for a very long time is likely to re require a first return to work, but they do, as I said, need to be fit at the start of the first return. So the first return isn't about, I'm not quite feeling 100%, so I'll use the first return to get back up to full health. It's I'm, I'm fit and ready to return to work, but because I've been out of the workplace for such an extended time, I need some additional um, kind of phasing back in just to build myself back up into work again. So no, occupational health don't have to be the ones to advise that you do it. Um, it's good practice to do anyway if someone's had a long absence. And then we've got a question from Deb. Um, is there any training for those completing the risk assessment? Um, absolutely, I'm sure um, we can um, look into the training that we um, provide. Um, absolutely, we can do some training on risk assessments. I'm not sure if we have any scheduled, but um, we will get back to you, Deb, with some um, options of, uh, around that. I'll, uh, I'll make sure, Deb, that on the uh, follow-up email that we send out, that we include um, some options for that so that you, you've got um, the information that you need. Um, to help with training with staff, but that's absolutely something we can help with. Okay, we've got another question in again uh, from Deb. If someone has been off sick due to COVID symptoms and they have a sick note, is it classed as sickness or new rules under COVID? Um, a test was negative but still had symptoms. Yeah, um, um, it would still be recorded as sickness, but we wouldn't be um, looking to um, use the COVID sickness um, recorded absences as part of um, any kind of process going forward um, so yeah it would be recorded as sickness but we'd probably treat it slightly differently and i think as well um you know in in terms of how we record that in in sam um so in terms of how you're actually monitoring that and tracking it um because as katie said it's going to take a different process it's going to follow a, a different path to normal absence um, we've actually put in um, new categories into our absence software um, specifically for COVID. So there's actually four different categories that you can assign it to. Um, and, and one of them being self-isolation, the other one being actual confirmed sickness, et cetera. Um, so, um, and we've, we've created that into a dashboard so that you can track people's, um, people's absence due to COVID as well. So I think maybe think about how you're, you're going to log those as well so that you can identify it if you need to. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Another question here we've got, um, can, you, can any manager do the return to work or only the HR manager? No, absolutely any manager. Um, I would look at your policy. If your policy says it will be the HR manager, then um, obviously don't go astray from that and, and start um, asking other people to do that. However, the HR manager may want to support with those um, more difficult ones, but generally speaking, um, it, it, it should be the line manager that carries out the return to work interview. But again, check your policy. Um, and another question that we had um, was um, around, again, around training for line managers to carry out return to work interviews. Yeah, um, that's something we can provide. Yeah. 
Absolutely. What we'll do is we'll send out some further information um, after the webinar on email for you, um, which should help um, with that. Okay, um, we've got another question here. Will uh, will the recording be emailed to participants? I can answer that bit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's absolutely. no problem. Um, yes, absolutely. I'll send out the recording after after this point. Um, I, I know we've all got everything going on at, at the moment. There's a lot of things to do, especially um, if you are coming up to the, the holiday periods. Um, yeah, absolutely. We'll send out a copy of the recording along with, as we said, information for you um, that might help. Um, both whether you're a school or a business um, in that sense, because the return to work process is very, very similar across all organisations and therefore the training can be done um, for both schools and businesses. Yeah. Um, are there any final questions before we um, before we go? We're more than happy to answer any further questions. Um, what I will say is a um, couple of things coming up that might be useful to you while we're, while we're just waiting to see if there's any further questions. Um, we do have other webinars scheduled um, in the next couple of weeks. So please do check out our training page. Again, I'll add those onto the follow-up email for you. Um, again, they're free to attend, um, covering um, key topics that are relevant to managing people at this time. Um, and within that as well, we've also got an introduction to our SAM people um, HR software webinar and also uh, to Sam if you want to know more about um, how we log um, staff absence management in the system um, and and how perhaps that could help you as school to save money. Um, we see that on average um, with with using Sam our clients reduce absence by about 40 percent. There's quite a big impact if you can do this process part of which of course is the managing return to work process which we've gone through today um, and I know with one client we actually saw um, a 60% reduction and all they did was do in, you know incorporate managing return to works on a regular basis as people came back. Um, it does have a, 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 a very good impact in terms of trying to reduce your absence rate um, so if you want any further information on any of that then um, please do let us know. We've got one further question um, come in. Uh, do staff who complete risk assessments need to have had risk assessments? And I wasn't quite sure. Good um, question. Really um, I, I guess what you're saying is, is um, the, the risk, the assess the risk assessment. To, are, are they still relevant to have one as well? Um, I should have put training. training. I, think I thought you might mean training, the, yeah. In terms of the first question, if we'd answer that as well, because it's still relevant, um, you know, as people are coming back to work, um, obviously, if they've been off, uh, whether that's for COVID or otherwise, you know, regardless of what level they are, it's still important to have that risk assessment carried out if needed. Mm -hmm. So even if it's the, you know, the person who normally does them, they still need to have that process applied for themselves. So make sure that you're not excluding leadership um, when you're going through the process. Um, and then the second bit saying, yes, it should say training. So should they have training? Um, yeah, I mean, again, there's no, um, I'm not aware of any statutory requirement, but it's always best that people are trained in the in the aspects that we're asking them to carry out. So, um, yeah, I would I would expect that they would have had some sort of internal training, if, if not um, further than that. And I think what we, especially with what we've learned recently with uh, managing vulnerable people coming back to work potentially as well, is the importance to document everything that you've got, you know, if you, if you agree, um, any kind of adjustments, the importance is to, or the emphasis is to make sure that you you have something on record that you can you can keep, uh, or in our case, upload to SAM um, for you know for for that agreement. Um, and obviously, carrying out a risk assessment is a great way of doing that. Um, so uh, yes, we'll we'll pop um, some information on about training again. Um, We've just got one about blank risk assessment forms and back to work interviews. We've got a whole um, suite of templates that. Um, we, we share for our Fusion and SAM clients. Um, if, if you're not a client, I'm sure we can we can share a, a copy. So um, we'll make a note. Absolutely, I'll send that out on the uh, on the follow up information. Uh, we've also got can we get a certificate of attendance for today's webinar? Um, absolutely, if you'd like one, um, you know, just let us know. We'll we'll send you one through. We don't normally do it for webinars, but we're more than happy to if you want to carry that forward from a from a CBT point of view. Absolutely fine. Um, we'll we'll send that over for you. Okay. Um, are there any final questions just before um, we finish off? Um, 
as we said, if, if there's anything we can do to help further with either the vulnerable risk assessments, risk assessment training, um, occupational health referrals, uh, or indeed the SAM software, then please don't hesitate to get in touch. Um, as I said, we will follow up the webinar and if you have any questions, then um, pop onto the website and, uh, and contact us straight away and we'll do our best to help. Um, I don't think we've got any further questions, so no, we'd like to say thank you thank very you. much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks to Katie for today. So much appreciated. And thanks to everybody who's attended. Um, and we'll see you again soon. Stay safe. Bye bye. Thank you.